and welcome to Spy Hearts Podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. Permission to pant heavily, sir. Permission granted. Okay, good. I'm Cam the Provocateur. Meow. Uh, I think before we uh, get to the film we're talking about this week, which you may have seen when you clicked play on this episode, I want to just uh, celebrate a little bit because this marks Meowks. our third year of podcast. <laughs> Meowks. Oh my, no, please. Let's just, just okay. put a stop okay. on the puns Fair now, shall we? Actually, actually, let's keep them flowing because we'll probably need it. Three years of podcasting. And, uh, you know, we're ringing it in. I mean, it's been a long road getting from there to here. But I think we've picked a great film to celebrate our three-year anniversary. But, Cam, how do you feel about podcasting about spy movies for three years? I think it was a rough beginning. But I think we have a lot to bark about now from where we're standing. <laughs> <laughs> we need to put a stop to these puns right meow. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, No, I mean, when I look at the journey of the podcast, I'm kind of in awe of it. And I think when you make a weekly show, or sometimes twice weekly, you kind of get lost in the process. A lot of it is our heads down, creating those episodes, and throwing them out there into the void. Uh, People giving us a lot of feedback, you know, that they've enjoyed them. But we're kind of like, huh, what? Sorry, we're on to the next episode. We, We can't think about that now. And so it's nice to have these moments to kind of reflect and go like, holy crap, look how much we've done. How did we get here? You just think about what's happened in the last year alone. Like, I I just forget interviews. We'll talk about that in a second. But in terms of the films we've looked at, we've dived deep into the treasures of Daniel Craig's James Bond films. But we've gone all the way back to like 1926 to cover... Buster Keaton in the general. We've mm-hmm. genuinely gone across the spectrum of spy movies. And, you know, you talk about when we started the show, we kind of front loaded it a little bit with some heavy hitters. Uh, it wasn't a, a, a choice to do so, it's probably us just being a bit silly. But, like, I, I found more joy in really sort of charting the course of spy movies over the, their lifespan of, of, you know, over 100 years worth of spy movies. And I've learned a lot from it. And just discovering things that some notable Matt Helm movies, people have heard of Matt Helm movies, but just kind of discovering that universe and having a lot of fun talking about it and joking around. And I think both of us have like this, like almost hero worship of Dean Martin at this point where we are actually trying to figure out how we can go see the Dean Martin statue in Vegas this summer. Um, I don't know that I would have been saying that I need to do this when we first started the show. Uh, Now it feels like an essential task I must accomplish. But I mean, even something like Five Fingers, a movie that I had no idea what it was. I had never heard of it. I added it to our master list early on because it was like, I'm sure on a list of top 200 spy films or something like that. Sure. And now it's like a movie where I'm like, this movie needs to be seen more. And I feel it actually is somewhat my duty as the host of a spy movie podcast to convince people to watch Five Fingers. Well, this is something that I wanted to bring up and you sort of led to it beautifully, is when I do get that beat, and because I handle most of the social media, you handle most of, well, all of the editing, I'll give you credit there. Uh, I hear more in terms of feedback. So it, it's genuinely lovely to hear that when we pick some of these weird films that are from the 1930s and 1940s and 1920s that you can find on YouTube have been like discarded just due to time, mm. that you you... You guys listening along are loving these films along with us and discovering new films that you like as well. Sometimes we might not like these films, but you might find something you really love in those what we deem to be bad films. But the fact is, we're adding to the discussion, or I like to think that we are, of spy movies. Because as we said, we front loaded the show, but I think it's gone on to prove that whilst James Bond might have been maybe the flag bearer for spy movies... I think this show proves that there's a lot more to espionage entertainment than 007. Yeah, and I mean, I have a sincere appreciation just to anyone out there who follows along with the show. You know, we see the weekly download numbers. And look, when we put out an episode on Skyfall or Spectre, 
we know they're going to do pretty good. There's a pretty big audience for Bond. But I look at a movie, say, like Lancer Spy, which we did fairly recently. A lot of people turned up to listen to us talk about Lancer Spy, a movie that is not particularly well remembered in the annals of spy film history. And so it's just exciting to see that people are also interested in joining along, not just talking about Bond or Mission Impossible or Bourne or all these kind of major franchises, but also these really obscure, forgotten movies that are often, you know, just streaming on YouTube. For sure. And then, you know, just pivoting a little bit, not just, which I'll get to in a second, the interviews, but just some of the guests we've had come on the show and grace the podcast with their presence. People that I've looked to as sort of people in the community, people like David Zaritsky came on and spoke about Quantum of Solace with us. And we had Jamel Bowie on to talk about The Fourth Protocol, who is you know a published writer. He goes on TV all the time to talk about politics. These are big names. And they're like, hey, I'll come talk about spy movies with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, exactly. And I like to think, you know, we grab spy movie fans from kind of all over the place, not just people that host, you know, spy movie stuff or write about spy movies, but people that have perspectives that are interesting. And I think that's one thing we've discovered is that like spy movies as a podcast format might sound kind of niche until you talk to people and suddenly realize like most people like spy movies. They may not realize they like spy movies. But maybe they like Mission Impossible movies on the side. Maybe they like Bourne movies. Maybe, like, they grew up watching Spy Kids. Like, spy movies have kind of impacted everyone's lives in one way or another, whether they are diving into, you know, Lancer Spy and Tonight We Raid Calais kind of stuff, or if they're just big fans of the big blockbuster franchises that, you know, show up in movies every summer. Yeah, it it's just goes to show, and there's been more of you that have joined in the last year and we're thankful that you're all here for the ride and you know i mentioned it just before but again look at who we've interviewed over the last year people that have said yes to us people like denise richards people like colin salmon uh i'm forgetting some big names i'm sure andrew davis roger donaldson directors that are heralded for their amazing work and they've all said yes to come on and speak about spy movies with us and it just blows my mind Yeah, Uh, when I look at the list of guests we've had, I am humbled. And I also have taken it as a lesson that I've given to people I've talked to about podcasting or also uh, beginning documentaries, which a lot of people I think have the sense, and I did as well, which is like, we should start small, right? Like you should really kind of like aim for kind of maybe like uh, more modest guests, guests who you might be able to get uh, on your show. We started with Nicholas Meyer, the writer-director of Star Trek II. My main lesson has been, aim high. You just mm-hmm. never quite know what's possible. Yeah, it, it's all within reach. If, if you're listening and you have a podcast and there's someone you want to talk to, the worst thing they can do is say no. So you just send that email and just put it out there, put that positive energy into the universe because you never know who is going to reply and say yes. And we've got some fantastic guests already recorded for the upcoming year of Spy Hards. There's some great ones to get excited about, but I think that's probably enough uh, patting ourselves on the back, Cam. I can never have enough patting myself on the back. Well, speaking of patting... Yeah, enough with taking a pause. Mm. It's it's starting to... Pause. Mm. Mm. (laughs) Mm. It's starting to rain here, Cam, but it's not water falling from the sky. It's something else. It's raining... um, Hmm... What is it we're talking about this week? We are talking about 2001's Cats and Dogs. We are kicking off another franchise, and this is a franchise. <laughs> it it definitely is a franchise. I, it's in keeping with Spy Hard's history to pick a movie that uh, isn't necessarily a beloved spy movie. Not that we're saying whether we like this film or not, but it's not one people will go to when they write their, you know, when you know vulture.com writes their top 10 spy movie lists i don't necessarily think hats and dogs is making that list but you know we are going to go in with open mind and open hearts and see what we think of this film i'm excited to tackle this franchise i'm looking forward to seeing where this journey takes me scott i am definitely very curious about that you just look at some of the other franchises we've got to tackle we have a lot of these sort of kid friendly you know spy movies to take a look at we did spy kids uh, we had a couple more along the way. Penguins and Madagascar we did in the last year as well. There's also things like Boss Baby out there we need to look at. There's a few of them. But, uh, you know, Cats and Dogs is one of those. And I wanted to sort of start that off. So I think what I'll do, if you've never seen Cats and Dogs before, and I mean, for shame, 
for shame. <laughs> if you haven't, here is your letterbox.com synopsis. Cats and dogs. Things are going to get hairy. When a professor develops a vaccine that eliminates human allergies to dogs, he unwittingly upsets the fragile balance of power between cats and dogs and touches off an epic battle for pet supremacy. The fur flies as the feline factions led by Mr. Tinkles square off against wide-eyed puppy Lou and his canine cohorts. I, I just want to take a second for uh, just to sort of pat them on the back for the alliteration of feline faction and canine cohorts. That is pretty good. Whoever wrote that gets major points for that. Um, but I feel like they're also more just like setting up like the conflict that is taking place before the movie even begins. Like they're not really actually talking about what the story of the movie is. Well, they, they do mention the, the scientist and having to sort of make sure that doesn't fall into the wrong hands. That is yeah. kind of the, the, the general driving force of the film. It's true. Yeah, no, that is accurate. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be a very heady discussion about cats and dogs, folks. Strap yourselves in. Yeah, I just feel like so much of the movie is driven by the Lou character and what he is going through, that puppy. Well, he's your protagonist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He is my... Um... poor protagonist. <laughs> protagonist. Oh, that's good. Good, yeah. Now, Cam, I know you saw basically every film in the theaters back in the sort of 2001 time, so you must be a big Cats and Dogs fan. I remember when this movie came out. That is my story about cats and dogs. <laughs> um, this came out, I think, wasn't it the same year as Spy Kids? Yes. Yeah. And so, and I'm going to talk about Spy Kids a little bit later when talking about this film as well. But I mean, um, if I wasn't going to see the latest Robert Rodriguez movie when I was 20 years old, I wasn't going to go see Cats and Dogs. Well, we did talk about this in the Spy Kids episode, but I, I you know, it's sort of early 20s for you at this point. Yeah, 20 years old. Yeah, so you, you've got that kind of uh, too cool for school attitude going on. I mean, wouldn't it be kind of odd if I was and all my friends were going to Cats and Dogs opening weekend? You're going in like furry outfits, really getting into it? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure, you know, we were really into uh, Mission Impossible 2 the previous summer. There was other big things we were excited about, but um, going to see like kids movies wasn't really a big part of my 20s. I think that's probably fair. Conversely for me, I don't think I saw this in theaters, but I think this is one of those films that we either had on VHS or DVD in the house and, and it was played quite a bit, much like Spy Kids. Oh, okay. So what did you think of it when you were younger? I have no memory of it. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, I remember watching it today when I was sort of putting my notes together for the review and being like, oh, yeah, I remember this. Oh, I remember that joke. So, like, it's clicking in my mind, but I don't think it left an impression where I was, you know, a big Lou fan. So were, like, your younger siblings watching it more, and at that point you just were watching other things? It That was probably more the case. It was like, you know, there was you know, five brothers. We did sort of all jostle for position on the television, but they definitely had their time, the younger brothers. So this is probably something that they put on and we would just sort of have to watch or I would casually go to my room and then come back again. But I think, like, by osmosis, I had seen this film. Sure. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, I also am, as an aside, a you know, dog lover, I suppose. I've had dogs all my life. I, you know, so I'm not averse to sort of, you know, canine movies, I suppose. I'm not a big fan of the ones that make them talk, which we'll get into. Yeah, I mean, I am a big cat and dog person. Um, so I, I like both. We had a lot of animals growing up. Uh, at one point in my life, we had like a dog, three cats, rabbits, iguana, two birds, fish. I think there might have been a hamster or something or a mouse at that point as well. Uh, I think there was turtles. We had a lot of animals at certain points in my life. Sure. And a partridge in a pear tree. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of animals in the Smith clan history. Yeah. And I currently have a greyhound as well. Mm -hmm. That uh, So I've, I've got my own dog. And this is the first film I think he actually actively watched with me. He was very interested by the TV today. Oh, interesting. Okay. Couldn't, couldn't take his eyes off. It was a weird experience, actually. Sort of. Uh, I, I had an interesting time watching him watch the film. Sh should he be a guest right now? Yeah, he's just really quiet. Can't you hear him? <laughs> Does he make whining sounds, though? That's a common greyhound thing. When he wants something. Okay, I'm chomping it at the bit. I need to know. 
How did we get cats and dogs? Okay, so yeah, Warner Brothers was furiously developing this idea for... <laughs> You've been writing these down. No, no, you? I just totally that's off the top of my down. head. None of them are written down. Uh, so oh, okay. no, no, I, I joke. Uh, what happened was, I'm a little unclear on this, and I think we are going to have a spy master interview this week talking to the director. Am I right, Scott? Yes, you're quite right, Cam. We have Mr. Lawrence Gutterman joining us later this week, the director of the film, to tell us all about working with uh, quite an all-star lineup on this film. Yeah, and so like this movie, in terms of like production notes not the easiest no one has really written the book yet about the making of cats and dogs and if you look at the wikipedia it gives you next to no information whatsoever it's uh it's it's bone dry it is bone dry yes good one um i did find <laughs> one site that gave a lot of production notes but it was really all tied to the technology about bringing the cats and dogs to life in this movie. It wasn't so much about development and what have you. Sure. So I'm looking forward to talking to the director about actually what happened. Because what I could find was like, initially, they were considering making this an animated film. Um, Interesting. At Warner Brothers. Okay. But the exec VP of production at the time, Jeff Robinoff, who would become uh, the head of the studio later on, um, asked the producer of the film, Chris Deferia, if there was another way to make the movie other than animated. Because animation is quite expensive mm -hmm. and so they must have had an idea at this point i'm unclear whether they had a screenplay or if it was more of a pitch that they were developing sure um so that i will need some uh, clarification on later this week but um one of the things they decided on was that like when they decided they wanted to go more of a live action route it was imperative to them they were creating real animals that didn't feel like puppets or cg that was their primary thing. They wanted it to feel like a seamless blend of real trained animals with movie making tricks so that you would get essentially the experience of watching real live cats and dogs on screen. Okay. I, I It's a heady thing to try and get. It's a tough ask, actually, I'd say, especially in 2001 slash 2000, I guess this was being shot. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just look at like the special effects in like, die another day the next year and they're abysmal sure i mean i guess you can look at the movie babe from what six years before this which george miller produced um chris noonan i think was the director on that one but george miller directed babe too and there have definitely been advancements in having you know animals talk on screen because i think babe nailed it but there was a movie i remember that came out either the same year as babe or the year before called gordy and it was like just absolutely critically reviled. It was about a talking pig as well. And I remember critics just mm. being like, oh my God, I have seen the apocalypse and it is Gordy. <laughs> and so like when Babe rolled around, like a lot of people had kind of their backs up of like, I can't do this again. I can't go through this again. And then Babe won everyone's hearts over. I, I actually, yeah, I think Babe is a, a great film. I'd never heard of Gordy. I just assume it's like the uh, animal <laughs> version of Ishtar. Sure, that could be our Patreon, Gordy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could hear them signing up right now. <laughs> Patreon.com slash spyhards. We'll see you there. I'm sure there's like a, uh, you know, best boy or uh, assistant sound mixer who worked on a spy movie or two. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So um, helping realize this movie, you have the director... Uh, Lawrence Guterman, who got noticed. He was a 1994 USC student who had his short film project, Headless. It got in front of Steven Spielberg, and Spielberg was impressed with it. And that led to him being hired to direct Goosebumps, Escape from Horrorland, the video game for DreamWorks. And so, like, that was kind of his foot in the door. And then he kind of helped out a little bit on Ants. He directed some sequences for that film. And was developing a live-action animation blend of Curious George okay. for Ron Howard producing uh, at that point. And it just got put on hold. And so he rolled into Cats and Dogs instead. Well, we've gone on the record before saying that Ants was better than A Bug's Life. And I'm sticking to that. Um, yeah, no, I, I do stand by that one. I love Pixar movies, but Bug's Life is pretty low tier for me personally. But I know it mm -hmm. definitely has its fans out there. Um, and, you know, Guterman really, you know, after this movie, he directed the Son of the Mask film with Jamie Kennedy. And that was really about it in terms of major films. But he did work on TV. He did a couple series, Jimmy's Head and Mongo Wrestling Alliance. 
but um, fairly um, small filmography, but I'm sure we'll talk to him about that. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, I'm interested to see, I mean, that Spielberg connection is just blowing my mind. And then I'm a big fan of Goosebumps. I watched a lot of the TV show growing up as well. So yeah, nice connections there. I'm sure we'll get into that on Friday. Did you ever play the Escape from Horrorland video game? I can't say I did, but there's a lot of video games I played as a kid that I have no recollection of. So maybe I'll look it up before we record the interview and see if I can find anything. Sure. And then this movie was written by a writing team, um, John Requa and Glenn Ficarra. And these guys are actually pretty big names uh okay they started off in animation on shows like the wild thornberries great show. and the angry beaver great show and they rolled right from those projects into writing the script for cats and dogs it's my nickname for you the angry beaver <laughs> canadian right mm-hmm. um and so like cats and dogs kind of got them their foot in the industry of writing major motion pictures and they wrote bad santa huh? they wrote the bad news bears remake uh, for Richard Linklater. Okay. And then they started directing as well as a team. And their debut was writing and directing I Love You, Philip Morris, the Jim Carrey, Ewan McGregor film. And they, since then, um, they didn't write, but they directed Crazy Stupid Love, the ensemble romantic comedy. They wrote and directed Focus, the Will Smith, Margot Roby con man film. Okay. They also made Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, the uh, Tina Fey film. And more recently have uh, written and directed episodes of television on the shows this is us and we crashed and they also fairly recently had a writing credit on jungle cruise most of the last things you mentioned i hadn't seen Mm. uh, but i have seen bad santa and i like that yeah yeah i've seen bad santa uh, bad news bears i love you philip morris uh, focus uh yeah any good uh, yeah, I think uh, all of them are actually pretty good. I don't have a negative word to say about any of these films. I haven't seen Crazy Stupid Love, and I know that that one has a real cult fandom around it. I p- should probably check it off the list at some point. Yeah, I don't watch a lot. Of, I mean, I get the impression that This Is Us, and that is, it's kind of like a teen sort of show from what I've seen. I don't think it's sort of my bag. I think it's more like, isn't it kind of like primetime soap opera kind of stuff? Okay, definitely not know. my bag then. Yeah, it, it's not us. We're We're old. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And so in the midst of developing the screenplay, they put together a test clip called Kung Fu Cat in the summer of 1999. And that was sort of the the test for whether this movie could work. And Kung Fu Cat convinced the studio that the approach worked for making a feature-length Cats and Dogs film. And they, they assembled real heavy hitters of the industry on this movie in the tech departments. They had the Jim Henson's Creature Shop joining the party. They also brought in Rhythm and Hues, which is a VFX department that's pretty high tier in terms of the major effects houses out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, They'd worked on the um, Ron Howard um, Grinch film, which was a, in terms of like visual effects, a very strong, very like noisy film. Like there's a lot to visually take in in that movie. So they definitely have pedigree when it comes to big blockbuster effects films. And they were also working with the Tippett studio and Phil Tippett was the stop motion mastermind who moved on and has worked in cg but he worked on jurassic park helping realize the dinosaurs with dennis Mirren and stan winston this is an all-star team we haven't even got to the casting of the actual actors yet yeah and i mean honestly when you read production notes there's nothing about the casting of the actors other than yeah they cast these people <laughs> see i'm fascinated to take this all to lawrence later this week then because there is a lot to uh, unravel well, you know, we we need to dig the hole like a, a dog would and find out all the treasures of cats and dogs. Yeah, like you can find like a 2000 word breakdown of just shooting day to day on set of this movie and just how difficult it was. Mm-hmm. For example, you know, having Mr. Tinkles, you had to hide six puppeteers in any shot featuring him that was the puppet, which I think was almost all of it. Uh, there's CG as well, but I don't know that there was a real animal used very much with Mr. Tinkles. No, I got the impression he was the big animatronic of the film. Yeah, and so you're having to compose all your shots to hide six puppeteers, and there was a, basically that going on in several sections of the movie. Like, technically, it seems like that's the story of this movie. It's just a team of people trying to make this work in terms of working with live-action animals, bringing in puppets, CG, very difficult to balance. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to be said in terms of uh, plate spinning for a director here because 
you often hear things like working with animals is probably the worst assignment you can have in Hollywood. And he's added in animatronics, uh, computer graphics, and Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> well, there was an old saying they said, you never want to work with animals or children. And Jeff Goldblum and uh, Elizabeth Perkins, they signed up to do both. Yeah, I thought you were going to make a joke about <laughs> the third one is Jeff Goldblum. Don't work with him. But... <laughs> <laughs> he seems delightful, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so this movie had a budget of $60 million. Domestically did 93.4. Wow. International, 107.3 for a worldwide total of $200.7 million. That ain't bad. I did not remember this movie as being such a success story. I don't think I thought it was a bomb by any stretch, but I didn't recall it being like that profitable. I mean, that must have put it in, you'll have it, I'm sure, but it definitely top 50 for the year. It's got to have done quite well. It landed at number 21 at the worldwide wow. box office for the year between the Tom Cruise film Vanilla Sky uh -huh. And it was just one spot above the Disney movie, Atlantis, The Lost Empire, which notably cost $120 million. So that's double the budget for Atlantis, which I know was a bit of a problem production and not held up as one of Disney's all-time great animated classics. But uh, there's a reason that coming out of 2001, a movie like this would be regarded as a hit, whereas Atlantis was regarded as a kind of a minor dud. And yet, I, I, I don't hear people talking about this film online. That's interesting. Like it, it clearly did very well. It clearly connected with audiences. And I know a lot of the people going to see this film in theaters will be families. It's a, it's a family film. It's, I think it's uh, U rated here. I guess I don't know what that is in North America. Yeah, it was either a G or a PG. Um, it could have been a PG just because it has some like kind of crass jokes. Okay, sure. Uh, a little bit of violence. Yeah, it was a PG. Like if it's G. You're not going to have like kind of poop jokes and stuff like that running throughout. Okay, maybe it was a PG here as well then. But yeah, I, you'd think it's like the people who were seeing it as a kid in 2001 are adults now. Like they're not mentioning cats and dogs online. They're the people on. Well, I'm depressed. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. You're uh, you got your walking cane now. You're uh, you're a whole different person. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Thanks for helping me celebrate three years, Scott, by reminding me of my own dwindling mortality. <laughs> You're three years closer. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so the top three for the year. Number one was the first Harry Potter film, whether you want to call it Philosopher's Stone or Sorcerer's Stone. Call it by its official title, Philosopher's Stone. That's right, Philosopher's Stone, yeah. Mm -hmm. Number two, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. Sure. And number three, Monsters, Inc. Okay, so kind of a lot of family films there, really. Yeah, and if I'm to look at this also, uh, it was very clear that like Pixar was carving the way that disney would go landing mm -hmm. at number three whereas atlantis was kind of this remnant of kind of the studio experimentations in 2d of the past sure i uh, i had no idea this film was so well received at the time that has that has blown me away a little bit i'm not surprised we're not going to get into the quality of the film but i just there doesn't seem to be a lot of like kids films that do that well that well i mean super mario is a recent example of a film that did really well but that's kind of got that like nostalgia video game built into it this is a completely new ip i do feel though like in this era family movies generally made money okay uh if you would have duds for sure like you know there'd be like that i don't know that george lucas animated film strange magic that came out that like no one saw and it was barely marketed but i do think like if you made a decent budgeted well advertised kids movie in those days parents went they didn't have streaming networks they didn't have you know kind of on demand programming for their kids at all times mm -hmm. and so i think if you start looking at box office in these kinds of eras you may not have top grocers of the year but most of these kind of movies did reasonably well and let's be honest parents are more than happy to fork over you know 20 30 bucks to not have to speak to their kids <laughs> for 80 to 90 minutes I do feel like Gordy did not do well. I mean, with a name like Gordy, are you ever going to do well? <laughs> True. And I do remember, actually, Babe was a big hit, but Babe 2 was a bit of a uh, disappointment, although it was quite expensive as well. That'll do, Cam. That'll do. Yeah. And so a couple of final notes. Uh, this movie had a Razzie nomination oh. for Worst Supporting Actor for Charlton Heston, which he shared the nomination for uh this 
and also Planet of the Apes and Town and Country, which Town and Country, completely forgotten. You can say that people don't necessarily bring up cats and dogs that much. Town and Country has never existed in human history, but it was a movie at one point that existed, and it was a very, very expensive romantic comedy with a lot of big stars. Warren Beatty was in it, and it was just a huge dud. Speaking of Ishtar, let's let's wheel that back a little bit then, because I have a couple of questions to unpack. Firstly, was Charlton Heston in the Planet of the Apes remake? Yeah, he's like a dying ape on a bed who Tim Roth goes to talk to. And he uses like the line where he says like, damn them all, damn them all to hell. Oh, so he gets to basically repeat his line from the first film. Something like that, yeah. Uh, it's very brief. It's more of a cameo than anything. Is he in the the sort of ape outfit or is he just doing a line? He's in the makeup, yeah. Wow, okay. And is this uh, at the point where Charlton Heston's gone full wackadoo? This would be landing, I think, the year before Bowling for Columbine, but he is known as kind of the NRA uh, spokesman around this point in time. So, uh, yes, he was someone who I think a lot of people had their eyebrows raised about. Mine is thoroughly raised as we speak. But okay, <laughs> uh, I, I'm understanding the Razzie nomination. I don't think his performance in this does anything uh, to offend me. Minor corrective, it was nominated and won. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't think his, his award-winning performance in this film does anything to bother me. He's barely in the movie. So to me, this feels like more of a swipe at his politics than anything he did in any of these movies. Sure, which probably actually puts more of a light on the Razzies than anything else. Well, the Razzies have no credibility whatsoever. It's usually driven by something petty. Just like us. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Anything else for us, Cap? Well, just the last thing. You know, you said we've kicked off a franchise. I think it's very interesting that this movie makes, you know, $200 million worldwide. And it's a 2001 movie. And you don't get follow-ups until 2010 and 2020. I find that absolutely bizarre. That is strange. I, I knew we had two other films to look at, which we'll probably talk about later. But I just assumed they were like, you know, 2004 and 2008 or something like that. But that's a whole 10 years or almost 10 years. I'm sure, well, again, we'll probably track as to why, but I wonder what happened. Yeah, because, you know, you think about, say, the Shrek movies. And I think Shrek was the same year as this film as well. Uh, and I mean, there was like Shrek movies every few years uh, going forward. There's a closer to home example, Spy Kids. Yeah, yeah. Like you had two, I think like it was, there was three within the next five years. Mm -hmm. And then you had the fourth one like a few more years after that. So yeah, like they, they really jumped on that. And that's a kid's spy movie. Like this is in the same vein. Yeah, maybe we can get some answers as to why there is no immediate follow-ups uh, when we talk to the director. And it did so well. Hmm. Lots of questions. Yeah. Lots of questions. Yeah, like Hollywood loves money. And yeah. like... You can easily, if you want to even save some money, lose the main cast, which I don't think any of the human actors are back in the second one. So you could actually save some money. You bring back all the animals. You've already developed the technology. So you're actually saving money on all that development you've done. You'd think they would have been cranking these things out every two years forever. Are you, are you telling me that Alexander Pollock's Scott Brody is not back in the next film? I believe he is not. No. Mm, okay. All right, well, we'll get to the Brody family at some point. But I I am uh, I'm itching. I probably should take my uh, flea medicine, but uh, <laughs> I'm itching to hear from you, Cam. You didn't see this on the original run. I did, so I think you should go first. Let's give a dog a bone. What did you think of Cats and Dogs? Here's the thing about Cats and Dogs. I think that the film has a genuine kind of concept it's pursuing. To me, this feels so heavily inspired by Joe Dante. When I watch it, like, I am seeing Gremlins and Gremlins 2, like, all over this movie. Like, the world building, when you sell this movie, you're saying, like, spy movie, right? Like, James Bond. And there are definitely allusions to James Bond stuff. Mm -hmm. But when I watch this movie, I don't get the vibe of, like, it is trying to capture the spirit of, say, like, spy-fi stuff. Like, say, the Spy Kids films are. This, to me, feels like it's very much going for that kind of suburban chaos of like the Spielberg productions where I was wondering where they called the Brody family because of Jaws. Mm. Uh, there's a shot of like flying cats going in front of the moon like E.T. Um, there are like gremlins illusions. There's even like the climax of this movie feels a little bit like Roger Rabbit 
in like this big, you know, factory with the gun shooting liquid everywhere. Uh, that sort of stuff felt like quite familiar and a lot of like kind of Spielbergian homages going on, or at least using that as a bit of a framework to tell this story. I think like there's an interesting concept here, which is like kind of doing this Looney Tunes-esque gremlins kind of riff in suburbia. I feel like the movie's missing the bite. It needs to kind of pull off the satire of the suburban stuff. To me, in terms of like the gags, some of them, they were painful, Scott. Like some of them just fell completely flat with me. There was some though that actually I thought were kind of clever. And I was like, oh, I never really thought about using that as a gag in a movie about cats and dogs. Like that's kind of fun. And some of the characters are really crazy and all over the place. And in a way that I thought was... It didn't feel lazy. Like, it felt like they were actually trying to come up with original concepts for this movie. But to me, like, the framework of the story, the idea of, like, this puppy landing, you know, in a house and the family learning to love the dog and the dog learning to love the family. This stuff was so, like, treacly and just, like, off-the-shelf parts that I found it just kind of, like, it was like it could barely be bothered investing in it. It just felt like the kind of thing I'd see in a Hallmark movie and it kind of dragged the movie down for me. And I think like Spy Kids is like almost like a shadow that hangs over this movie because I look at what Spy Kids is doing. Same kind of thing. It is looking at the same audience. It wants a theater full of kids and their parents. It is speaking to both the adults and the kids. It is also tackling family and what that means. Not a new concept in family movies, mm -hmm. but they're doing it in a way that feels fresh, energetic, funny, insightful. And like this movie just, every time it falls back on kind of the morals and the lessons, I feel like I'm watching an episode of Full House or something. Like one of these very like kind of pat sitcoms. It just didn't work for me in that way. Even if I can sit there and say like, oh, there's some visual imagination on screen here that I enjoyed. And I'll definitely highlight some of those examples uh, going forward. But it was a real mixed bag for me. It just feels like you open this movie as well with a shot of a camera like panning down like over a white picket fence onto the lawn. And I'm like, oh my God, it's like the shot in Blue Velvet yeah, where you're going to go beneath the grass and see all the bugs underneath. They're obviously not going to do that. It's a kid's movie. But I'm thinking they're setting this up in a way where they're saying like, we are going to basically satirize like the American white picket house family. And I feel like they kind of don't do anything interesting with that see I, I, i'll pick up on that point because it's where you left off i don't think there was really any satirical elements to this film i think it's more straight sort of broad comedy i agree yeah but it feels like you when you're just presenting like the the kind of the kid driven story in this I, if i were a kid i would have been bored sitting through scenes like that like they're not fun and energetic it's like it feels just so generic i would be like get back to the cats and dogs already i think the uh, nothing you said here was was new to me in that sense i think a lot of it i'll agree with i definitely found this to be a, a very charming affair mm. i have to say from from my point of view maybe that's a touch of nostalgia but the thing i had to put my uh my thinking cap on when i was when i was watching this for the second time i watched it twice today really love that cats and dogs peeps but it's we we covered some kids films recently and i think one thing i can be critical of myself for is trying to come at those films from an adult perspective and maybe being a bit hypercritical of them and some of the choices they make whereas really they're gauged and aimed at kids so i had a bowl of cheerios i i you know i i didn't have a shower i played some video games and thought hey let's, let's get in the mind space of like 14 year old scott what's he doing i listened to some lip biscuit uh really really got psyched up for this film yeah uh but no i put myself in the headspace of a of, of a kid trying to watch this or like a family friendly film i think i had a much better time for doing it as i said it's charming it's breezy it's, I think it's very well paced. I think the characters are kind of fun. I like the spy elements it weaves in. I don't think it it goes above or maybe like reaches the potential of the idea of the story they had. But for what you get for an 80, 85 minute spy comedy about t dogs and cats that are fighting, I think it's it's a fairly sort of 
harmless way of spending your time. I laughed at some moments. Some moments didn't work for me, but it wasn't offensive. No, no. Like, this was not a chore to sit through. I just think, like, when I'm looking at this particular era in terms of family entertainment, and I'm seeing that first Shrek, Mm -hmm. you've got Spy Kids. These are things that are, like, pushing forward what family entertainment is at this time. Look at right now, where you have something like Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse in theaters. There's a level of artistic ambition, I think, in the movies we remember versus the ones like this. I think there was definitely... um, technical invention going on like they were obviously having to work very hard to realize the effects of these animals and pulling off some of these gags i just think in terms of like creating a a story a narrative built around this it comes up pretty short it's it's definitely a tough one because we, you know you talk about some of the invention and some of the skill they put into making this film and there is a lot to praise when it comes to the visuals of this film for me at least anyway I, I understand your point. I just, for me, I have to sort of sit there and go, okay, you, you stick in, you know, a third of the audience is adults, two thirds of the audience is kids that say every adult comes in with two kids. Are most of them entertained for the 85 minutes? I would think so. And I think that is proof, or is proved by the fact that it was a box office hit. I think families enjoyed going to see it and got a lot out of it. Now, us as two stuffy old blokes probably don't get as much out of it. But I think from that perspective, and I think I use that same sort of perspective on the first Spy Kids film, and I, but I had, I think that is a stronger film. I will agree with you there. And Shrek is, I think, out of the three, probably the, the best of those three if you were comparing them. But I think there is just a charm to this film. It is doing something interesting. There's a nice nugget of, of sort of a, an idea there. It's kind of fun to see the world, the sort of, you know, below the surface that the cats and dogs have been waging war for thousands of years back to you know ancient Egypt hundreds of years ago where like cats ruled over man and made them build the pyramids in their image and stuff and then the, the dogs saved us the greyhounds of the of Egypt save us saved us and sort of you know freed us from the slavery of the cats it, it's all weird mythology it's just kind of fun like I, I I don't think I was putting too much pressure on this to deliver in terms of this big mythology or this big like satisfying plot I think I just wanted to go in and sort of have a few laughs which is what it delivered for me I, I actually really like the idea of the world building like the whole thing is like cats versus dogs like how was this movie not made like long before Taylor's oldest time right it's it's you know Tom and Jerry yeah, exactly. Like you can look at, yeah, exactly. Like more animation based stuff, but like the idea of building like a kind of like an action comedy around cats versus dogs, it just seems crazy. Like it took till 2001 to get something like this, especially to tie it into like a spy thing. It seems like it should be so obvious. And I, it, yeah, I mean, I give them points for coming up with that. And I did like the mythology of the Egyptian stuff. I thought there was some definite, um, cleverness to the way they built the spy agency like it's ridiculous and it's lots of like visual gags but it also feels like something they thought through uh you know like when they would have cleanup teams for example that would come in to repair all the damage that a cat fighting a dog would cause in a house it's the kind of thing where you go like oh that's that's actually really clever or yeah i think my favorite gag in the movie was like um when there's the uh, cut the red wire, yep, and the dog's like, oh, I'm colorblind, <laughs> <laughs> and you're just like, oh yeah, of course. How would he know? Like, that is, I, I wrote down like some of my favorite jokes in this, and that's like number one with a bullet is the colorblind dog joke because it's like it's Alec Baldwin saying, I'm colorblind. How would I know? It's like, yeah, oh yeah, that's that's so weird. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents. Keeping the lights on at Spy Hard's HQ ain't cheap. And frankly, nor is feeding the school of attack piranhas. So we need your help. Roger that, Scott. Only at the Spy Hards Patreon can you gain access to exclusive shows like Agents in the Field, which tackles non-spy films starring your favorite spy icons, and The Debrief, where we channel our inner solitaires and predict how the big spy movie news of today will impact tomorrow. So make like a Treadstone agent and activate your Patreon membership at patreon.com slash spyhards today. Cam, tell the people what we have in our sights this week. Scott, in honor of our annual pilgrimage, we are celebrating Vegas Month on the Patreon. First up, we are going to look at 1960's Ocean's Eleven, starring the Rat Pack. Hopefully this movie 
feels like the cinematic equivalent of hitting 21 again and again and again. But before this message self-destructs, Cam resume the spy chinks. But I, I guess we're sort of pivoting over to things that we liked about this film. And I'll say it as, as number one, is I just think the sort of animation work and the puppetry is, I'm not going to say seamless, because you can still kind of tell that it's 2001. But this looks a, a lot better than some of the other CG we were getting at this time. It's it's pretty well weaved in. Yeah, like you can definitely, you know, pick out like a CG cat face mm -hmm. and be like, oh, that is some 2001 CG going on. Uh, there's definitely moments like that throughout the film. You're just going to get that from a movie from that era. Sure. But like when we've watched some other things, you know, like there's nothing here as egregious, for example, as the like Bond uh, hang gliding in front of a tidal wave that looks like absolute garbage in Die Another Day. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like really bad effects stuff there. Here, um, I mean, I can definitely say some of it looks dated, but because the movie is kind of pitched as a Looney Tunes cartoon, and again, that's kind of where the, the Joe Dante gremlin stuff really comes into play. Like these feel mm -hmm. like they're very much coming from the same sources of inspiration, and I'm sure that Gremlins was a bit of a model here. Um, because it has that kind of heightened reality and kind of frantic kind of pace to it, the CG stuff never gets bogged down. It's like quick gags and you're like moving on. You're not spending a prolonged period of time staring into the soulless CG face of a cat as it does a monologue. You know what I mean? Like it's quick and moving on. This isn't the Polar Express. Oh, great example. I think, was this the same year also? It's right around this time point, yeah. I think it's around 2001, 2002. Yeah, it, that, that is a... I mean, but that's the thing. Like, that is a pure CG movie. You have to stare at the CG. The CG used in this film is a lot of, like, you know, the ninja cats jumping across the screen. But, like, it's quick. It's snappy cuts. It's not uh, prolonged you know, viewing. You mentioned Mr. Tinkle as a sort of antagonist of the film. Uh, Blofeld's cat, as I wrote him down, because it is basically what it's styled off of. Uh, is but I think almost entirely animatronic. There was only a couple shots to me where Mr. Tinkles looked like a real cat. Yeah, but then there's a couple other cats that are some CG elements, and they use CG to do the mouth moving stuff because yeah. you can't dogs can't do that on demand, obviously, and they can't talk. And nor can cats. And they're not doing the old school peanut butter trick. What's that when they sort of like move their mouth as they're licking? Yeah, they would put peanut butter in their mouths and then film them as they were like. Opening and closing their mouths. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I think this is a, a seamless integration of that sort of technology. I, I don't... I mean, the, video, the version I watched, I think, was quite low res. I don't think there's a high-definition version of this film out there. Yeah, so, like, the version I watched off Apple, it looked pretty low-grade, and yeah. I'm guessing it was the DVD, and I'm wondering if they can't be bothered upgrading it because they don't want to deal with upgrading the effects work or something. Well, that's like a, a problem that hits a lot of things. I mean, something that we both care about is, you know, Star Trek, and they won't do that for Deep Space Nine or Voyager because it's prohibitively expensive to upgrade the digital effects that both see, both shows really did rely on. And I'm sure also if you're Warner Brothers, you are like weighing the dollars and cents of like, how much money can we generate from a Cats and Dogs Blu-ray release? Mm. Uh, well, they, they could probably the money it costs to to do that and have to like maybe even pay people like Jeff Goldblum for their likeness again to re-release it. Yeah. They could probably make another Cats and Dogs film with just a bunch of nobodies. Well, that's Cats and Dogs three. <laughs> Strap in, folks. Yeah, yeah. I think we are going to be doing two and three in a single episode because three uh, was not even theatrical in North America. It only played in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> we take we that. love it. We love it over here. You guys are having a great old time with Cats uh, and Dogs 3. It, it's it's biscuits all day. It's treats and belly rubs over here in the UK. Uh, yeah, I think that's what we're going to do because uh, we, we don't want you guys to suffer in any more than you need to. The second and third will be rolled into one. But I, I want to throw it to you. I mentioned sort of animation and puppetry. Something you liked, Cam. I think I just like appreciate the commitment to just kind of this zippy animation based tone uh and like the decision to not make it an animated film that would have been the easy choice but it would have been more expensive as well i think they did a good job kind of capturing the spirit of like a looney tunes cartoon there's the point where he's actually like watching one on tv mm -hmm. as well and i think 
that they actually played that animated short before the movie in theaters. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that was something they did. And I mean, I think it's committed to that and it understands that type of storytelling. It doesn't kind of like stop, you know, and hold still. Really, you know, the family drama stuff does. But I think when it comes to like the hijinks, all the cats versus dogs stuff, it really moves at a clip. And I think that's when it's at its best. I think so too. Yeah, when they're sort of detached from Lou, played by, you know, Tobey Maguire as sort of your protagonist here yeah uh detached from the family it's, it's a lot of fun to watch i think something we'll get to in dislikes maybe uh there but yeah it, it's very fast paced stuff that whole sort of fight at the in the last sort of 10 minutes flies by and it looks great yeah and there's just like visual gags they'll throw out like there's the like the q branch like sequence where you see like the you know the scratching post and like the fake cat going like meow 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 boom like a really fun visual gag, but they just move on. They're like, okay, on to the next thing. Like, that mm-hmm. got a laugh. We're not going to now line up three more gags just like this. It's, like, very happy to kind of bounce all over. And, like, as much as I can say, like, for example, the, like, variations on the no soup for you joke, which was very clearly in the ether at that point because of Seinfeld's popularity. Um, there's the no lunch for you and uh, no charge for you. Uh, lines but like those I could roll my eyes at but then there would be a, a weird line like when uh, Mr. Tinkles says to his second in command like I want you to stay here why because I hate you <laughs> that got a <laughs> laugh out of me I was like wow what a kind of like mean spirited dark line to work into a kids movie that's kind of more of what I wanted like it was a little bit of that kind of anarchic uh, kind of like gremlins energy where it's like Jerry Dante stuff yeah yeah where it's like kind of working in more kind of like biting humor for the adults i i i well we'll take this question to lawrence but i, I wonder whether that's like a studio thing whether they want this to be more family friendly because i mean gremlins was pitched as a family film i think it, gremlins the original was the reason we have a pg-13 in north america okay. uh, because it, it at that point there wasn't one it came out as a pg movie the same year actually as indiana jones and the temple of doom got a pg and uh. parents were so infuriated that uh, that was the birth of the PG-13. The first PG-13 was Red Dawn, but uh, when Gremlins 2 rolled out a few years later, it was a PG-13. Go Wolverines. Mm, yes. Uh, another thing I wanted to jump on, and it's something that we haven't really spoken about, and that's probably because there was no sort of behind the scenes, is the cast. Mm. Now, I'm just going to read you, guys, if you haven't watched the film, just a list of people in this film. You've got Alec Baldwin. Toby Maguire, Jeff Goldblum, Elizabeth Perkins, Miriam Margolis. Uh, scrolling down to they they list this very weirdly on IMDb, so I have to scroll right yeah. to the end of the list for the rest of this uh, sort of cast. But you've got people like Sean Hayes, Susan Sarandon, a guy whose name I can never pronounce correctly, Joe Pantaleono, Liano. Just call him Joey Pants. That was like his uh, mob nickname, right? Good old Joey Pants. Uh, Michael Clark Duncan, John Lovitz, uh, Salome Jens is there, Charlton Heston, uh, Billy West is in the film. Crazy list of people they've got in. And somebody's not even just the voice cast. As I mentioned before, you've got you know the Brody family played by Elizabeth Perkins and Jeff Goldblum. And they've, they've got top billing, it looks like, on the film, yeah. quite rightly so. But yeah, it, it's an all-star lineup. And I don't think you've got... a particularly bad performance in the bunch i know obviously heston got a razzie for it but i don't really think that's deserved no i mean i barely even remember him in the movie and i watched it like four hours ago he's like the big guy in charge of the whatever they named it is it canine intelligence or something like that yeah yeah something yeah. like that yeah yeah sure so, yeah i i have to i should have to remember what name that name is but yeah he's fine but they're all fun performances and you worry with like a lot of actors doing voiceovers that they're not quite dynamic enough to deliver it. But yeah, you know, Toby Maguire, I think, is uh, the perfect choice for this sort of earnest puppy, which he'll then go on to play the exact same role later this year or next year for Spider Man, basically. Yeah, I'm guessing he probably had shot Spider Man at this point, possibly. I th- well, Spider Man was delayed because of uh, what happened later this year. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, he may have shot Spider-Man at the time um, when he did this. I'm not exactly sure in the ordering of 
when he would have recorded his voiceover for this movie. But yeah, um, he was sprinting off the set of Spider Man in full garb <laughs> into the voice box, the, the voice box, the, the the voiceover booth to do his lines for Cats and Dogs. I'm sure. That's right. It was very much like the uh, first sound sequence in uh, Babylon. But uh, I think like uh, Tobey Maguire is great in this movie. I think like he has so much energy. And Scott, you and I often will joke, uh, Red Alert, uh, Star Trek the Animated Series, which was in the 1970s. And they brought back the original cast to make that animated TV show. Mm -hmm. And William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and the various cast members sound like they are asleep. Or possibly have like sniper sights aimed on them as they are at the recording mics. Because it is like, red alert, look out the view screen. Like it's very stilted. Tobey Maguire seems to be like throwing himself into this performance. Like it's energetic. Like he's, there's very good, I think, direction going on with the voice acting. Where is Tobey Maguire at this point? Obviously Spider-Man's not out. But is he a big name? Uh, he's a little bit of like an indie darling because okay. he had done the movie The Ice Storm and gotten a lot of acclaim for that. Um, I think he had done the Ang Lee movie Ride with the Devil. Uh, he was doing kind of like more independent work on the cusp of becoming much more of a recognizable name because of Spider-Man. And Baldwin was just the 90s was kind of his time anyway. But the only other name that jumped out to me in the bunch is Elizabeth Perkins. Now, I remember her from Flintstones, but that's about all I have for her. For her. Like, where was she? That's about all I've got, too. I don't have a okay. lot of uh, Elizabeth Perkins' um, backstory. She's great in that. I mean, I noticed she worked on the TV show more recently, This Is Us, which the writers of this movie uh, wrote and directed on. So uh, I guess that's something. Oh, she was on the TV show uh, Weeds for many seasons. I never watched Weeds, but it was very popular. Yeah, I haven't seen Weeds either, but I know it was quite a long-running successful show. So yeah, I you know, again, great cast, and they gave great performances, so I can't fault that. And I mean, Jeff Goldblum to me is pretty charming in this movie. I think like he's very much channeling, or at least the filmmakers are channeling Rick Moranis in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids quite a bit uh, going on, especially with like the goofy outfits they put him in during his, you know, emerge from the inventor's lab kind of moments. I had Egon written down in my notes, but yeah, same thing. That's a good one as well. Yeah. Um, so Goldblum is just so naturally quirky. There's the bit where, like, he first meets the dog and is, like, smelling the back of the dog and just spewing random techno babble. And I'm like, this is why you hire Jeff Goldblum. He makes this stuff fun. Yeah, he, he does. Uh, I, I, I don't know if he knew the assignment when he signed up how many dogs he'd have to sniff, but <laughs> I hope he isn't actually allergic to them. That'd be amazing if he was. He suffered for his art. He did. He, he <laughs> truly, he truly, truly did. But uh, I was going to say it was a rough shoot, but I already used the rough pun. So at this mm, point, uh, you know, I'm just belaboring it. You're you're a real Scooby Doofus. Mm. Mm. Well, speaking mm. of uh, bad things, Cam, I need to talk about a couple of things with you. OK. Now, you you know me, Cam. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. OK. I deal with facts. And I'm sure you've heard of stuff like Big Pharma big oil, big tech, you know, these sort of shadowy conglomerates sort of controlling the narrative out there. Now, I've noticed a trend in Hollywood, and I'm going to point something out here, and this might blow all of your minds. I think this film was made by Big Dog. Oh, yeah. Like, it's the classic demonizing of the cat, which is such a common thing in pop culture. But uh, yeah, uh, cats often not treated well in uh, family entertainment. No, I mean, I, was, I went in like a bit of a rabbit hole. I should have come up with like a dog or cat pun with that, but we'll go with rabbit hole. Uh, You're mixing in, your metaphors. I, I really am. <laughs> I am. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I, I delved deep mm. into the tapestry of, of the potential of big dog. And, you know, you've got all these... The capestry. The, the capestry, yes, of course. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, uh, um, oh, I got a better one. Tap up street. I don't think that was better. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, pull up yourself. Uh, okay. Yeah. Fair. But like, you know, you've got all these films throughout history. Where is the cat air bud? There's no air whiskers. You know what I think it is? 
I think that there's probably a filmmaker who would love to make the cat air bud. Cats are notoriously horrible to direct. Like, try to get a cat to do what you want on command. Good luck. Yeah. And, you know, Red Alert, there's all the stories about working with Data's cat on Next Generation and how much they couldn't stand dealing with Spot the cat. So I think if you are making a movie like this, there's a reason that I think a lot of the cats are CG or mm. um, animatronics. You know, there's a lot of shots where people are carrying a cat or there's a close-up of a real cat's face. But you're not seeing a lot of elaborate acting by the cats throughout sequences. Like, they are full CG bodies. You know, there's like the the ninja cats and everything mm. like that. Where it's like, okay, uh, they didn't even bother trying to convince me I'm looking at a real cat at this point. Um, I think that's why. And I think it's just easier to uh, embrace the dog because Lord knows they're a lot easier to deal with on set. Well, uh, you know, if you want an example of what it's like to work with a cat just go watch you and live twice yeah yeah and i mean we've there's been other examples we've stumbled across there's the cat of course and you only live twice where when the bomb goes off that the cat is like melting it's down losing its mind it's 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 not having none of it but we saw another one with like cats that were like losing their mind oh i remember what it was it was um logan's run on the patreon and there's the part where there's like the kind of the old dilapidated building where it's like riddled with cats it's the library of congress but yes go on yeah that's right thank you and there's like the fight and michael york throws a guy or vice versa mm. over a table and like they hit a cat and a cat just goes like flying across the scene <laughs> and it's like anything you read about the production of that scene they just talk about like how difficult it was to corral the cats and how they really only have like one or two cats per shot things like that I mean, I I've not got anything against cats per se, personally. Like, but you know, I'm thoroughly allergic to them. Uh, in fact, cats have like have caused me a genuine uh, bad times in my life. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm not against cats. Like, I think there needs to be a Molly and me about a cat. I mean, I do love cats. Um, I've had cats that were just as close to me as any dog I've ever met. Uh, mm -hmm. and people always have the whole, like, well, cats are aloof, and they don't care about you, and it's like, I've seen cats that disprove that theory. Some do. Some are like, I'm in my own world, and I don't care, and then others will be actually quite bonded to people. Uh, it's entirely the cat you pick, folks, but I mean, to me, like, yeah, it, the whole dogs are the greatest of all kind, I'm like, yeah, some dogs are. Yeah. Some aren't. <laughs> I've met some real jerk dogs. <laughs> you talk about aloof cats. You should meet my greyhound. He doesn't give a monkeys if I'm in the building half the time. Yeah, I know. I've seen that in greyhounds as well. We've had, I think, five or six at this point. And um, yeah, some are like your best friend in the world. And then other ones are like like a cat, you know, like the stereotypical cat of just like, uh, I don't know. I'm just going to do what I do. Yeah, and it, he seems happy, but yeah, he's not exactly a man's best friend. I'm just pointing out, putting it out. And now I had another thing I want to point out when it comes to dislikes. I was going to just say, actually, you know, there was that recent Call of the Wild adaptation based on the Jack London book mm -hmm. with Harrison Ford, where they used an all CG dog in the movie. That may be the way you get your cat as hero movie, all CG cat, because they don't want to work with a real one. Is that just not prohibitively expensive? Uh, well, I don't know that Call of the Wild was like mega budget. I think at this point you can use very dodgy CG to realize this. Um, and you can also control the circumstances way more. Plus, it's just the animal welfare aspects as well. That's true. And and we found out recently with Harrison Ford signing on to do the new Captain America film that he'll turn up for the opening of a sandwich shop if you pay him enough money. So maybe he will return for the cat version of that film. Well, we shall find out. Cat pin america mm. i had one more bone to pick with this film mm. you're welcome and that is that this might possibly be the worst family in cinema history let's start with the basics you've got the son played by mr alexander pollock who hasn't done much acting i think after this point so i'm not going to not gonna lump on his performance. Yeah, yeah. But this is meant to be like your human tether to the film. He sees his brand new puppy and calls it a loser. <laughs> I hate him. I hate everything he stands for. Immediately disliked him. Yeah. Let's move over to Jeff Goldblum. 
Now, if that isn't the best example of an absentee father you've ever seen, I don't know what he is because he is the worst male role model I think I've come across in a long time. Actually, probably the worst male role model I've seen on this show since Brian Mills. Well, it's like there's so many movies about like, your parents just need to learn to work less. <laughs> it's mm. like, this is coming from an industry where people making movies are working like 16 hour days. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know that you should be the ones expounding this lesson to everyone. But I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is the only reason the Goldblum character uh, manages to charm at all mm -hmm. is because it's Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. This character is like completely self-involved and a terrible father, probably a terrible husband as well, but I don't have evidence of that. Well, you have evidence he's at least had sex once. At least once. At least, at least. And then the last culprit of perhaps the worst family in cinema history is the mother, who firstly doesn't give a monkeys what's going on, you know, around her house when she pops in, isn't all that great with her son. And the biggest thing that rubbed me the wrong way as a pet owner is she established zero boundaries with the dog and proceeds to chastise every time it does something wrong in her eyes. There's no training. Now he, None whatsoever. There's no training. There's no house training. He's a puppy. He's brand new. And then he gets, you know, he gets tricked by a spy, a ninja spy, and they leave a little dog poo out. And they chuck him outside. They leave their dogs outside overnight. Mm. You do not do that in my house. No way, siree. And then, like, the other thing where, the, where Lou, our dog protagonist, Toby Maguire's Lou, you know, ends up in the trash after fighting another dog. I think it might even be the same. It's the same cat, isn't it? It's fighting a cat, sorry. It's a ninja cat again. And uh, again gets thrown out of the house. And she just tells him off and calls him a bad dog. And I just think that you're bad. You're the bad person. You're all bad. They should get thrown out of the house and Lou should get free reign. I wish this movie had a little more of like kind of a satirical edge, like say Tim Burton would bring, mm. where he would recognize the weirdness of this family. Yeah. And I think they Quirky. kind of, yeah, like they kind of get it with the Jeff Goldblum character. Like they're definitely portraying him as being kind of weird, right? Like we made mm -hmm. Egon and, um, you know, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids comparisons to that character. But like, I wish they'd played up a little more of the way that say like Edward Scissorhands does or Beetlejuice, you know, where it's like recognize the oddness of this family and play it up because a, I think that would be funnier and B it would make us a lot more forgiving of the absolutely bizarre parenting behavior going on in this movie. Mm -hmm. And then like, C it would make kind of the um, treacly kind of like feel good isms that go on a little more funny because they're landing in such a weird tone family where clearly the filmmakers are trying to communicate an absolutely bizarre bunch of characters or at least to the adults watching yeah yeah well i think yeah, like i think for us don't you think even as a young kid you'd rather watch say like adam's family kids to like this kid here playing like soccer in his backyard i think as a kid it was more about the spy stuff i just think like you're Time is occupied watching this kid's story in this movie. And mm -hmm. I think the more kind of, uh, you know, wit and kind of comic energy you can bring to that, kids are grabbed more. Well, like, they could have easily written in, like, a strange coping mechanism for the mum or something like that. Sure. Because, you know, her, her husband ignores her all day long working in his lab, and her son hates her. So, you know, what is she an alcoholic or something like that? Like, you could go quite dark and funny with it. You know, she, like, just takes swigs every five minutes and stuff like that. Or she's, like, hiding a bottle of wine somewhere. You could just... That's a joke you could add in. Yeah, or just offhand joke at some point. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I think we both agree this is the worst family ever. Yeah. And I mean, like, I'm not going to say anything too bad about Alexander Pollock as the kid. Because I generally blame... Uh, lackluster kid performances on the uh, the fact that like they say with like kid performances the key to getting a great one is uh, people that can really direct children performances and then also a star for them to work with so you know you look at like Haley Joel Osment in The Sixth Sense he is a good child actor but you're also pairing him with M. Night Shyamalan who is known to be very good with kids and then also Bruce Willis who by all accounts was very you know like committed to working with him through every step of the process here this kid's working with puppets half the time and i think like 
on a technical level, the movie is so challenging that it wouldn't surprise me if a, more attention was being paid to the technicalities of achieving the movie than like the kid's performance. I have to interrupt because I've just did a little search on Alexander Pollock's IMDb. Yeah. And not only was he born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia. Cool. So he's one of yours. Yeah, one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> he's also starred in a TV series called Taken. Yeah, I've seen it. Uh, it was a Steven Spielberg produced science fiction miniseries. Uh, I actually really liked it. Wow. Uh, I don't know what he did in it, though. I can't find his role. But uh, yeah, there you go. It's like divided up. Each part like jumps another decade or so. So it's like he could have been at any time point in that. It switches protagonists almost every episode. Yeah. I mean, this year he also worked alongside Jean-Claude Van Damme and Michael Rooker in a film. So, yeah, he did some stuff. Replicant. I have seen it. Mm, well, you've seen everything, Cam. I know. Shocking. I have followed well, the work of Alexander Pollock very closely. <laughs> he's he's your, actually your neighbor. Exactly. Yes, yes. And I mean, yeah. uh, I will say this movie was shot in Vancouver. And uh, yeah, I recognized a number of locations. I mean, the house... I don't know where it is. I can go there, I guess. Uh, the address is printed online. But um, the uh, what a tour that would be! What a tour! <laughs> the cats like, and dogs I, tour. I've joked in the past about how, like, you know, you get all these like famous sites from Hitchcock movies, The Ip Chris File, Bond stuff. I so far have like Ballistic X versus Sever, a random building from Bad Company, and um, the house from Cats and Dogs, as well as when they are driving to the uh, stadium where there's like the con to get them, uh, you know, uh -huh. kidnapped by the cats. Like that's Pacific Coliseum. I've seen many of concerts there. Uh, it's just like the area they're driving around. I recognize all that. Also the whole like uh, meeting at the pier sequence. That's like, what, a five minute walk from my house. You, I think you need to do it. You need to go out there and do the cats and dogs tour for us, Cam, so we can see the sites now, what they look like in the year 2023. It's tough because whenever they shoot in Vancouver, they really obscure like the specific spot things are taking place on. Like the waterfront pier stuff, I know where it is. I just don't know the specific location they're using because they've kind of like masked any sort of geography as to where it is in relation to anything else. Um, the house would be, I think, fairly easy to track down. Although I have questions as to how easy it would be to get to through commuting. I feel like I might be like taking an hour and a half commute to get there. Ah, don't worry about it. The time taken isn't very important. Here's the thing. I've never bothered to track down the uh, apartment complex from Look Who's Talking, which is also in Vancouver. Sure. I don't know that I would be, like, bumping the cats and dogs house ahead of that. That makes sense. But, yeah, I've taken up the last sort of 10 minutes talking about my two big dislikes. I want to hear from you, Cam, because you actually didn't like this so much, much as I did anyway. So what are your dislikes? Well, I thought, you know, I, I underlined it, like, the family story stuff. And to me, it's just mm -hmm. like... It's just so hit or miss uh, in that, like, you know, I've talked about, you know, gags I like, but there's a lot that I didn't where they just kind of fell flat. A lot of the, like, kind of poop gags, I was like, eh, okay, like, mm -hmm. they just felt kind of like lowest common denominator. And I think it's like, if you're, you can tell, like, a scatological gag, but you want to, like, get it across in a way that feels, like, smart or clever, like, oh, that kind of took me by surprise. This movie didn't take me by surprise very often with a lot of its uh, jokes. I also had questions like the whole cats rule, dogs rule thing. Was that just taken from Homeward Bound, which had the line cats rule, dogs drool, and then they reversed it? It has to be. It, it, it's where it's the sort of coming to the vernacular, I imagine. Yeah. And so then I like start to question like how much of an identity does this movie have on its own? I can, like, draw lines to all the things it's drawing from. But, like, I don't think this movie has as much of an identity, say, as Spy Kids, which mm -hmm. feels very much like Robert Rodriguez creating a world. Here I'm like, it's taking bits of this, you know, some 60s Bond, Gremlins, various other things. How much is actually feeling like they're actually kind of carving out new territory? I think the cats and dogs element does, but I don't know that when I look at it as a film, it feels as sort of like... It's just not as interesting or as inventive as the things it's drawing from. You want to think that they're going to take references and elevate it a bit. And I didn't really get the sense here. Well, there was a lot of like, I thought there was like puns left on the table that could have been used. I'm surprised there was not a line about there being pussies galore or something like that. Like, Well, that's a sequel. That just, is it actually called that? I think it's called The Revenge of Kitty Galore. Okay. Okay. I also had a couple other ones down. I wrote You Only Live Nine Times. 
Sure. Oh, did you notice the the moment where um, they introduced the Susan Sarandon dog? There's a weak spot. I have no idea what that character is doing in this movie. Made no sense. Like she came out of absolutely nowhere and had this backstory that's never resolved. No, and I mean like is mostly there, I guess, to indicate that the Alec Baldwin character had like a traumatic home situation as a dog. But mm. other than that, I don't know. But did you notice that when she gets out of the dumpster when she's introduced, they do a shot between her two front legs showing uh, Lou and it's framed the way like the Bond shot, you know, the uh, free rise only poster. I did not catch that, but I will be putting a picture of that online. Don't you worry about it. Yeah, I thought that was actually Wonderful. quite clever. That's the kind of thing I wish they'd done a little more of. Because to me, like when I'm... If someone asked me, like, is this a really fun kind of, like, spy spoof? I'd be like, eh. Like, it has the kind of the classic spy elements, but they don't feel specific a lot of the time. Whereas well, a moment like broad. that felt... Spe- yeah, it's very broad, but a moment like that felt specific. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's something I wrote down in my notes is, uh, you know, it it's taking things from other places like the spy elements, but at least it's not spy hard where it's just sort of just grabbing recklessly at pop culture and just shoving it into the film yeah there's no pulp fiction like dance number for no reason here no no so i I appreciate there's a sort of tonal consistency going on in this film i have one other dislike i wanted to just quickly mention and that is the rules of this universe don't make sense to me uh okay in which way Okay, so, and I said at the start, this is going to be a very intellectual discussion about cats and dogs. So this is where we go with this, folks. We're talking about this mythological universe where cats and dogs can talk. Now they can talk to each other. Mm. Cats can talk to humans. Yeah. Dogs can't? Uh, I think the dogs can, they just don't. Well, then here's... Uh, hmm. Why? To keep the illusion going? Then say that, because there's a point later on, and we haven't spoken about this sort of, apart from in the synopsis at the start, the main thing that Jeff Goldblum's character as a scientist is trying to achieve is creating a uh, sort of a allergy medicine to stop people being allergic to dogs so they can become sort of the ruling species next to humans, basically, on the planet. And it's the cats trying to foil it. And our antagonist, uh, Mr... Mr. Kibbles was his name? <laughs> uh, Mr. Tinkles. Tinkles. Mr. Tinkles. Mr. Tinkles uh, eventually gets the serum and reverses it to make everyone allergic to dogs. And so they wheel down a Pomeranian after f- firing this into the, the, the son's face. And the Pomeranian just starts barking at him as if he's just a normal dog. Whereas these other dogs are all quite smart and know what's going on. Uh, are some dogs smart and some dogs not smart? Well, that could be the case just for humans in general, so why should dogs be any different? Um, hey, 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 you clicked play on Cats and Dogs to review, folks. Don't, yeah. get, uh, don't get up here at us that we're talking about cats and dogs. Yeah, like, to me, it's very broad strokes world building. Like, sure. the mythology stuff's fun. The idea of the spy agency and the fact that they're kind of, like, packing all these, you know, control rooms with, uh, you know, gags and characters at consoles and all that. That's kind of, like, as far as it goes. You're not getting a real breakdown. Like, the character Peak, who basically operates underneath a garbage can in the street, I'm like, how often is he there? Is he there all the time? That seems depressing. Does, doesn't he have a house he needs to go to to eat and sleep and stuff? Like, what's he yeah, doing? Yeah, like, what a dark life for this character. I mean, it does sound like you in the editing studio all the time. Yeah. I mean, cats, the whole thing about cats, they often say, is that cats are more intelligent. So maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe like, that's part of the reason the cats are talking more. But I don't know. They, they, it seemed to indicate the kid seems to catch on that Lou can talk. And yeah. at the end does, you know, talk to Lou. And Lou kind of like winks at him. So I would mm. get the impression from that that they're trying to say that Lou can talk, but they just hide it from humans. This sounds like a burning question that we have to take to Lawrence later this week. That and hopefully it's answered as well in the uh, second and third installments in this franchise oh i cannot wait i cannot wait uh but i think before we wrap up and and ask about the knock list cam any sort of final notes uh what have you got for us i got a couple things a couple more references um the whole thing with uh, mr mason was very weekend at bernie's um i thought that was actually uh kind of amusing when they were bringing him in and speaking for him into the factory there was that meant to be blofeld is that the is that the sort of joke there that it's like Blofeld's cat has become evil and that he is you know he he was 
Blofeld. And so, you know what I mean? Like, the, the evil power has gone to the cat, in a sense. I don't think he's supposed to be evil. Isn't he just the head of that company? Sure. I think the company, they're, the cats are just using as their front. Yeah, but then to most people, Blofeld just owned, like, a, a bank, didn't he, basically? But Blofeld is, like, evil. I don't think Mr. Mason is, like, a villain. I don't think he's plotting world domination yeah, but like, anything. Uh, well, actually, tying it into this film beautifully, uh, Blofeld in On Her Majesty's Secret Service is, to most people, just running an allergy thing. Yeah, but the movie gives us no indication Mr. Mason has ever done anything evil in his entire life. Right, but it doesn't indicate that he hasn't. Ah! I'll, I'll let you have this one. Ah! Um, there's also a line that uh, Tinkles says to the Miriam Margolis character. Um, she calls him, like, Large Marge, which I'm pretty sure is a reference to Pee-wee's Big Adventure. That one jumped out at me. Uh, Miriam Mar- uh, Margolis. Um, she is an actress who is like the world's greatest Graham Norton guest ever. Mm-hmm. I would like to hear her stories about this production. I am sure they are memorable. Um, a couple other things. I had the um, the buzzsaw coming around in a circle and then dropping mm. uh, when they're in the barn. Very Looney Tunes. Appreciated that. Um, also, this had a sin that you and I just cannot forgive, which is fast motion comedy. When you had like Sam the dog rolling in the street in fast motion, always the worst, always the worst. It, it's never, ever, ever good. It is, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's the 90 second street of comedy. Yeah. Also not great. Um, you have the two ninja cats making a lot of Bruce Lee sounds. Yeah. Uh, two white guys voiced by, uh, Daniel Mann and Billy West. Um. Yep, 2001, folks. Yep, that sounds like a very 2001 choice. Uh, My notes, we've used a couple already, which was, you know, the missed opportunities for puns. I said, like, pussies galore. I always had, like, octopussies. They are putting that in a kid's movie. There's zero chance that's going in a kid's movie. Okay, but you only live nine times would have been a nice little line. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask if you're a dog or a cat person. I'm a dog person. I think you're probably a dog person, despite having both. Uh, my favorite pet of all time was a cat. So okay, yeah, I might be more cat. Okay, you're a cat person. Fine. Uh, I had two other points. One, I'm surprised you didn't mention. And I dropped a hint about this very early on in the opening of the show, and that is about Lou, our dog. Lou is played by a dog actor called Prada. And uh, where might you have also seen this dog, Cam? Prada, the name rings a bell. Like, I've heard of this Uh, dog before. Yeah, okay. Was it something we covered? It's not something we've covered, but it's something we've definitely watched. Oh, my God. You better just say it. I know it's going to bother me because I remember seeing the name Prada come up in relation to a dog. What was it from? Can I give you a hint? You and I have seen and heard stuff about Prada in person together. Oh my god, it was one of Archer's beagles on Star Trek Enterprise. It certainly was. Holy it crap. It was the first one. Prada was the first beagle to play Porthos in Star Trek Enterprise. Holy smokes, that's incredible. Scott, you get a gold star for our third anniversary. That is the greatest bit of uh, behind-the-scenes insights you could ever bring. And last but not least, uh, to top it all off and to connect it back to the Honor Majesty's rib I just made a minute ago, this uh, film also finally shows us just how Christmas trees are grown. That is true. That is true. A sobering mm. thought. It is. It is. It is real. Real. Yeah. And let's get real, Cam. Let's get very real. Three years of Spy Hards. We're talking about cats and dogs. The knock list grows... Slower than it used to, but I think it's a bit more of a picky thing to get onto. But it's all still to play for. Cats and dogs. Is it making the knock list? Bark once for yes, twice for no. Cam, what do you think? Scott, this is not a perfect movie. (laughs) (laughs) That pun was appalling, I'll tell you that. Uh, No, for me, this is a no. I, I just think like... When it's very tough for me to not compare this to Spy Kids, which did make the knock list. Yeah. Which I look at, it's giving a, you know, really fun look at the world of like spy fi entertainment. It's a great mm-hmm. introductory step for kids. And I just think it has way more like visual imagination. It has a lot more personality just because Robert Rodriguez brings so much of himself 
mm-hmm. to every movie he makes. So like for me, not just like, you know, the Spy Kids first film, but just like kind of the world that they created that carried through only one sequel. There was never any more than the one sequel to Spy Kids to the best of my memory. But like to me, that is kind of like the bar I'm looking at for kind of like family films that would get onto a knock list for Spy Hearts. I just don't think this one is strong enough. No, I think that's uh, very understandable. I think our discussion here is fairly telegraphed at that point. Uh, but I'm glad we had I'm glad we watched this film again. I'm glad I sort of rediscovered something I was looking at in my youth. God, that was so long ago. Huh. And I want to be mm. fair, like, this was better than I expected. I really, yeah. going in, had a lot of dread about Cats and Dogs. And I, I wonder how much of that is more informed. Because if you look it up on, like, Rotten Tomatoes, it was not horribly reviewed. No. Um, Roger Ebert gave it a glowing review. Yeah, so it's got like some, you know, some decent reviews, some supporters. I think my memory was more tied to the reception of the sequel than this one. Okay, which which we'll get to. But yeah, so that's one no. I, I think for me, I'm not far behind you. I think I definitely enjoyed this film a bit more than you, Cam. I think I sort of took my analytical helmet off and just sort of met it on its level. It's crazy charming a bit kooky level but i don't think it really delivered on the promise it had of having sort of a first of all that sort of joe dante-esque satirical look at uh you know suburbia which it it, it, it wants to do that yeah like a sense of self-awareness yeah yeah something like that yeah i mean in a world that's got like you know underground tunnels where dog cars shoot along to dog hq the human world seems very normal and they don't do anything to really point that out. Like it's just there. It would be fun if you even had like a human who was like, did I just see something? Oh, I guess not. Like having things basically happening around them that humans are almost realizing, but not quite like things like that yeah. could have been fun. Yeah. 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 Or like, you know, the dogs have like neuralized or something like that. And you can make a pun out of that somehow. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot you could do there. And uh but I still I think I enjoyed it. I'm not I'm not gonna say yes to Knocker, so it, it's a no, but it's still a film I would enjoy. And when it comes to family films we've tackled, Spy Kids One made the knock list. I think I would place this probably next to Spy Kids One before the rest of the Spy Kids films. I think I would put Spy Kids two maybe ahead. But I mean this is bounds and leaps better than Spy Kids 3 and 4. Yeah, we talk about rough CG. Yeah. That's Spy Kids 3 game over. That is a horrible sit, especially when you're watching it twice. And I watched this, you know, to try fit our schedule in today, I watched this twice in a row, basically. Mm. I had a half hour break and had some food in between. And it wasn't like it was a particularly painful time. I had I had a worse time sitting through Tenet. Sure. Hey, hey. <laughs> I'm just saying this was breezy. Like it was just kind of easy to sit through. I didn't hurt right. my brain, uh, and I and I appreciate that. Yeah. But two no's, and as such, cats and dogs is not making the knock list. Unfortunately, folks, the dossier on the film is complete and buried in the backyard. <laughs> it's been a bad dog. <laughs> it's been a very bad dog. Uh, but. Uh, I want to thank again everyone who has been on board this journey for the last three years with Spy Hards. Plenty more with us came from there. I don't think we've cracked a, a quarter of our list of films yet. And uh, I think our content grows steadily by the week when it comes to interviews and things like that as well. So, yeah, thank you all for coming on this journey with us. But, Cam, I'm going to fire the question to you. I'm going to toss the Frisbee your way. What are we talking about next week? Yeah, so, I mean, towards the end of this week, of course, we'll have our interview with Lawrence Guterman. So check that out, the director of Cats and Dogs. And next week, it's been a while since we've tackled any Hitchcock on the Spy Hards feed. Well, it's time to go back. We are going to look at 1966's Torn Curtain, starring Paul Newman and Julie Andrews. Yes, I'm looking forward to this one. As ever, we have a fantastic guest and Cam has uh, twitched a few curtains in his day, so he knows all about that film. And don't forget, of course, later this week, we will be sitting down with the director of Cats and Dogs, Mr. Lawrence Guterman. Don't miss out on that one too. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to join us next week as we tackle Torn Curtain. If you like 
what you heard on this episode, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But as always, after three years of SpyHards podcasting, just remember, evil does not wear a bonnet. Thank <laughs> you.